Hi everyone, um, my name is Megan Finerty and I'm saying hi. Um, I work with the Storytellers Project out of USA Today and the Arizona Republic. And some of you guys might know that I have, um, I was a reporter at the Arizona Republic for a million years and a long time ago, my job was nightlife and events reporter. And in 2016, I took the Storytellers Project, which started in Phoenix as the Arizona Storytellers Project in 2011. We took it national and now we are across the country. We're in 22 cities and um, we share, um, we have live, more than 100 live storytelling nights across the nation. Not right now. Right now we've gone all digital. <laughs> We're doing virtual storytelling nights twice a week or twice a month. Um, but we also sell narrative consulting services to nonprofits and individuals. But I'm not selling you guys anything today. I, I'm a huge fan of Phoenix and the, Val or, um, the state of Arizona. I'm a transplant from Indiana. And I appreciate the way that small businesses and independent businesses make our state so singular and so wonderful. And so I um, have volunteered my time today on behalf of Local First and um, certainly on behalf of the Arizona Republic and USA Today to share with you guys some basic storytelling skills that I hope can um, certainly help you communicate what you do, why you're passionate about it, and how your work makes a difference for others. So those are the three components of what we'll be learning today. And you might be like, well, what am I gonna do with this information right now? I'm still social distancing maybe, or you're not sure when you're gonna open up next. And so I wanna promise you off the top of our, of our time today, what you'll be able to use today's um, information for, um, this can help you think about what you're, how to adjust your like about me page um, if you have like a website. Um, also, ideally, this is for small talk. Actually, the name of this, this exercise is called turning small talk into something big. But I know that um, because we're thinking about your foundational, some like big foundational ideas, that often people end up using what they've um, explored during this session to lead to other stories and like larger writing exercises. If you're um, trying to work on any marketing collateral right now, or maybe you're trying to define some of your offerings right now in a new world, um, today's session will, I promise you, provide clarity. So um, the first thing I wanna start with is to say, um, I wanna start with a tiny story that models what we're gonna talk about, but also I hope it wins you over. It won't be long. So if you're like, oh my God, lady, why are you talking? Don't worry about it, it's gonna be short. But here's the deal. I'm from a small town in Northwest Indiana and it was not a very fancy town. Um, it was uh, like 25,000 people, like really steel mill town um, and like, poor pretty blue collar like intensely blue collar and but like a good a good town right like a great place to be from but just not didn't have a lot going for it and when i grew up there people didn't make it special or fascinating like there weren't cool restaurants, there weren't special neat bars, there weren't buildings built by compelling architects trying to create a sense of place. We did have a very cool public library, but it had been built a long time ago, like not while I was there. Um, and when I moved to Phoenix, this was obviously like the biggest city. I'd been to Chicago a bunch, but I didn't live there. So Phoenix was the biggest city I'd ever lived in. And I was suddenly like overwhelmed by um, the pleasure and how interesting it was to talk to so many entrepreneurs and chefs and artists and culture creators and architects and historic preservationists and small business owners and boutique owners who were so invested in making Phoenix and the Valley and then further on later in my work, like the whole state, a cool and interesting place to live, a place that reflected who they were and what they were interested in and what they were passionate about. And I never, I never tired of telling their stories. And I felt really special and lucky to be able to tell everyone who read the Arizona Republic or AZ Central, like, meet these interesting people. They're spending all day long just like trying to make your life more interesting by running their business well. And I've met so many entrepreneurs and small business owners over the years who I know put their whole soul into their business, whether they are like run a printing shop or they sell furniture or they sell clothes or they make food or bread. Um, all of them, all of you do so with this sense of purpose and passion and service, I think in your heart to like make your community better. And that's probably why you're a member of Vocal First. And so I want you to know that that's in my heart 
I don't take for granted living in Arizona and I don't take for granted that you are the people that make my life more interesting and worth living here. My hometown has gotten cooler over the years. Like people in my generation actually moved back and I think have like opened much more interesting businesses and tried to really nurture a sense of place there. But the economy there is still like pretty shaky and there's not business, there's not work for me to do there as a journalist. So I'm also grateful to live in Arizona where like I have a full-time paying job as a journalist. That's a pretty special thing. So with that, I want to offer you that thought from my heart to yours. Um, it is my goal today to offer you some basic storytelling tips and techniques. I will put things in the chat so that you don't have to remember everything I say. <laughs> also, um, I will be using a worksheet that um, I'm sharing with Local First. Uh, if they have everyone's emails, by the way, you can, um, they can like send that to you in a second, but you don't need it right this minute. Um, and again, I'll be putting some comments in the chat if you can read it, but we will follow this whole thing up. I will share what I put in the chat and I will share the worksheet with all of you um, through Local First when it's over so that if you didn't keep track of everything I was saying, don't worry about it. It'll be in your inbox shortly. Also, this is a participatory exercise. This I hope is the most talking I'm gonna do. So I know all of you are muted right now, um, but it would be helpful to me if any of you would be willing to unmute at some point and forward and like raise your hand and being willing to like give me a chat. I can see some of your names. Some of you just have iPhone though, so I'm not going to lie, <laughs> or just some initials. So I don't know everyone who's on here, but I do see some, um, some familiar faces. So if you want to raise your hand uh, or you've already been through this exercise with me, which a few of you have, um, you guys can be the plants. Um, but anyway, I hope this is a warm room and that you guys find this useful. So we are gonna get right into it. Um, so the first idea, so this session is typically called turning small talk into something big. And most of us fall into one of two categories. I am a kind of small talker that like overshares and thinks if I tell you every good thing about myself, then maybe you will like me and wanna do business with me or let me interview you or like, I don't know, be my friend. And I have been told that this is like trying to get a sip of water from a fire hose, that this is sometimes very overwhelming for people uh, and it doesn't work for everyone. <laughs> I mean, some people like me, I have friends, I do okay, but um, it's not like the best first impression. Others of you though might be listening to me and you might think, I hate small talk. I dread waiting in like line at the bar till the, you know, dinner line, till dinner opens and, and chatting with strangers, or I never really know what to say when I have to meet strangers because you just end up like talking about the weather or you tell people what you do, but they don't really know what you do. So they don't know what to say back. Um, and if you couple into basically either bucket, I'm promising you that today's exercise is going to work. Another thing I want to say is we are not going to be getting into like anybody's weird stories right now. So if you're like, I have a bunch of private stuff or I come from a family or a cultural tradition that doesn't talk about their business, no problem. We're not going to talk about anything we shouldn't be. This is really predicated on like, it will be, it's supposed to be workplace friendly, like very public facing and appropriate disclosures. So nothing nothing that you wouldn't honestly say at a cocktail party and you say at a cocktail party because also i will tell you this what i will say at a cocktail party is probably far beyond your threshold for normal and appropriate small talk so this is about you not about me um I, i'm very like self-disclosing again not necessarily working for me so we're gonna get into it i think what i hope this helps with is also that a lot of us have been told i think rightfully so not to like talk too much about ourselves when we meet new people so i'm putting some of this in the chat real quick if you're following along um we're afraid that we're going to over disclose or that we're going to be boring worse we don't want to seem uncurious about others right that would be that's terrible at a cocktail party but when we meet new people, it's impossible to know when you meet a new person whether or not they're gonna be your new best friend or your new next collaborator or your new hire, or for some of you, a potential client, business partner, something, you know, who knows? And so I feel really strongly that our ability to be a successful person is not entirely predicated on our ability to network, but it is, it is in large part predicated on our ability to get people to be curious about us. And so that is how low the bar is for small talk for me. I want you to know that at the end of this, what exercise, what we're trying to get people to do is be open to like a follow-up email, be open to chatting with you again later at the party, like be open to crossing the 
the room next time someone runs into you. Um, and if you have a direct like business, um, ideally they would be open to like, like thinking of you next time they needed your services or something like that. And how we're going to do that is by letting you talk about your passion, but in a way that's like digestible, direct, and easily understood and like made relevant by the audience. Because I know that all of us are nervous usually about like, you don't want to be guilty of talking about your passion, like having somebody tune out because they don't care. Uh, we're not going to do that. In fact, we're going to like teach you right now how to talk about your passion in a way that's actionable. So I'm going to share my screen. So if you're not looking at the screen right now, uh, it'd be cool if you started. Um, and I'm going to share real quick. Okay. So if you are playing along at home, I would ask you to grab a sheet of paper um, or something you can jot notes down on, or you can like open your, you know, open up a Word document or just grab a notebook or something like that. And we will be using this document, which again, um, I'll put the questions in the chat so you can follow along there. We will also send this to you at the end of the session. Okay, so we're gonna start off with, what do you do? And I know if you're like me, you're like, oh my God, Megan, what do I not do? Are you kidding me? And here's what I'll say, you're right. <laughs> Especially if you're a solo proprietor or you lead a relatively small team. Yeah, you do like 47 things a day. Um, but what we wanna explore here is like, what doesn't get done if you don't show up? Or how would you explain this to your mom? Or like, what is the part of your job that is interesting? Cause I know I could be like, uh, what do I do all day? I keep my inbox close to like 200. It used to be zero, but now with the we're in quarantine, it's like 200. Um, but that's our first question. But I'm gonna, um, and I'm gonna type it here in the chat, but I'm also now gonna give you an example. Once a hundred years ago, I had to introduce Kate, um, sorry, Kate Gallego at a like feminist voting event. And it wasn't partisan, it was just celebrating the 19th Amendment. And I was like, Kate, hey, uh, you know, what does a city councilwoman do? And because I didn't like, I don't know about you guys, but the last time I took civics was high school. So I was both, I tried to make it seem like I was asking on behalf of the audience, but to be honest, you guys, it was because I wasn't sure. And so Kate was like, well, I represent my constituents. And um, also Kate knows I tell this story. So like, don't be like, oh my God, Megan Finner was talking about you, Kate. Like, trust me, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the fool here. So Kate was like, well, I represent my constituents. And I was like, yeah, I know. But like, there are actually like children in the audience. And like, I don't know, they're like, what does that mean? Like, I can't draw it. Like, it's not a great verb or a great noun. So I was like, well, Kate, you know, I don't know. Like, what do people call your office needing help with? And she was like, oh my God, all kinds of things. And then she like literally made the list, right? She said, oh, people call because um, a, a water line is open at the end of their street. They need their trees trimmed because the delivery trucks keep hitting them or something like that. Uh, maybe it was about like flight patterns with Sky Harbor or they need to be connected to higher levels of government. Like maybe at the time, you know, John McCain's office wasn't returning their calls or I, who knows what, right? But like Kate was like, you know, we can connect you to lots of resources, that's, that's it. So when I got to interview Kate, during the session, I certainly said her job title, that she was a Phoenix City Councilwoman. But then I said, it's Kate's job to connect the people who live in her district with the resources that they need uh, to like, get the most out of living in Phoenix. And then I literally like, gave a couple examples. That took less than 45 seconds. It went super quickly. But what I wanted to do, and this is what you want to do, I wanted to give the audience something to remember so that they'd know how Kate was relevant in their life. So first, if she doesn't represent them, okay, she's not that relevant to them, but like they have a representative themselves. But I wanted them to be able to remember this little moment and think, oh, wait a minute, I know who to call about this problem I'm having or a problem my friend is having. And that's what you wanna be able to do, is if somebody ever needs your service or someone knows someone who does, you just want them to remember that you do this thing that is useful to other people. And you can't communicate that elegantly sometimes if you just tell people your job title or if you aren't too specific. Now, some of you also might have like a really esoteric job title. I know I do. Um, and I use this example a lot. Um, once I was interviewing Nicole Carroll, our former editor in chief, and I want you to notice, I referred to her as our editor in chief at the Arizona Republic. Her actual job title was like senior vice president of audience acquisition and blah, blah, blah. Like literally had 45 words and was a total word salad. 
But if what you needed to know is like, where does the buck stop in that newsroom? And like, who do I get in touch with about some really important idea or problem or issue? It's Nicole. And if I tell you her like Gannett job title, that's not gonna help you get in touch with her or know what she does for our community. So by letting you know, she's the editor in chief and her responsibility is to run the newsroom. I and mean, that's like pretty useful information for most people. They know what to do with that. So now I'm gonna be quiet for a second and I'm gonna ask you to jot some notes down. I'm gonna set a tiny timer on my phone. And I'm gonna just ask you to like write down, how would you introduce yourself so that people would know what you do? This is the verb of your job. I'm gonna mute me, I'm gonna set a tiny timer. I can't hear you. All right, we're good. That's the little timer sound. Okay. So, who wants to go first? Who wants to read their, tell us what they put their job title as? Is that Paul? Are you raising your hand, Paul? Okay, you can unmute. <clears throat> Paul. Artist and teacher promoting the art of scratchboard. Uh oh, I'm not. No, it was just me. It, it didn't come across right away. Can you? Okay, we're good. I'll do it again. Yep, Paul, thank you. artist and teacher promoting the art of scratchboard. Okay. The art of scratchboard. Sorry, I thought that's what you said. Okay, great. No. Okay. Um, do you think you should tell people what that is or what it looks like? That, that now engages it. Like, what is Scratchboard? That's true. Hello. Now okay, it's your right. turn. Oh my God, now you guys, I just fell into Paul's trap. Now it's your turn. Paul's like, lady, I've been doing this since before you were born. Okay. 50 years. Okay, see, there you go. Um, okay, well, I do have a lot of follow-up questions for you. Um, Paul, do you run a, but just for the purposes now, I'm mean, just for our purposes, like, um, do you run a consultancy or do you own a business or what's your, what's your role here? I'm an illustrator. Uh-huh. Okay. Artist. Awesome. And yeah. then I also have a, a new business. It's called <clears throat> Scratchboard University. So it's online. So I do, I have a kit and then I have a series of videos. So it's tabletop art. That's awesome. Okay, I love this. Um, and timely. Uh, okay, Paul, thank you so much for going first and breaking the ice. Um, yeah. We'll come back to you later. Does anybody want to um, also, does anybody want to follow in Paul's shoes? Gail, okay, let's do it. Oh, you got to, oh, Gail, are you unmuted? 
Can anyone else hear her? No. Gail. Gail is unmuted. Yeah, I can't hear you. Is your microphone turned on? Okay. Well, you can put it in the chat. I don't know what to say. I can't hear you, but you're welcome to put it in the chat. Okay, um, Gail, are you typing it into the chat or what do you wanna do? Oh, okay. Nicole, if you wanna go first though, I'm happy to have you go while Gail does that. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Nicole. I'm the director of Hotel McCoy and Art Hotel in Tucson. I innovate consistently to assure that we stand out in our in this industry and focus on our mission of representing the community of Tucson and connecting our guests with Arizona art and culture through social media and creative connective experiences. Awesome, that's good. Hi, Nicole, nice to meet you. Um, I love Tucson. You um, here's what I would say. Um, oh, I just lost you. Um, innovate is not a super obvious verb. Um, and like connect is not bad. So like what I want you to do, like one of the exercises here is yeah. like, to take out as much jargon as possible. And more like, I organize this and this and this. I do this and this and this. Like, so really tactical. Yeah, like, do you organize art shows in the, in the hotel to connect people to art? Or do you make sure that like, there's local art all over the hotel in a ro rotating basis? So then I would say something like, and I run a, we run a commission-free art program. We turned our lobby into an art gallery and each yeah, room. Yeah, that's very specific. I can see it. Okay, cool. Thanks. That's helpful. That's like, you know, and you can say, you can give me three examples. Like, it's not weird because I don't have your job. Like, I yeah. know what you do because like, I know what you do, but. I'm, I'm, it's funny when you're talking, I'm more like you, like I'm the overshare at any time someone asks me stuff. So. <laughs> When, when I don't have it written down, it usually comes out, but maybe that's better in these cases. Yeah, I mean, that's why I do this, because I was like oversharing and it was weird. Um, you know, so I was like, oh, you got to narrow this down. So that's what I would say to you is like, write down like three things that you think people would be able to imagine in their brain. Like they know that you send emails, but if you could say like, oh, I'm in charge of organizing this, doing this and doing this, that's help. That's going to take us where we're headed next. Gotcha. Cool. Awesome. Gail, I see your answer. Thank you so much for being willing to type it. I'm sorry we can't hear you right now. Um, again, I'm gonna ask you, so like you help people figure out the importance of making a great first impression on paper and in person. Um, so I'd also say here, like, do you facilitate workshops? Do you like do training and coaching? Is it all online? Like anything you can do that has a strong verb, like that helps me in picture in my brain, like this is literally what I do because then I know what I'd hire you for. Um, Paul, you, when you, yeah, exactly. Cause like, it didn't occur to me that you do resumes, but like everyone needs help with a resume. So like, I would lead with that, especially in this economy probably. So when you introduce people, be like, oh, I run first impressions, image consulting and coaching. I, um, I coach people on resumes and I help out with customer service queries, mock interviews, presentation skills. I'm really a one-stop shop for helping figure out your, like, um, your big, the intros of all of your communications needs, like the, the open, the top of the funnel for a lot of your communications needs okay i'd be like okay now i know what you do right and i'd be like oh now i can like call gail when i need somebody to yeah do my resume you're welcome perfect um paul my tiny bit of feedback for you is i would definitely like again at the top you're right you did hook me with scratch board but the, the only thing i'm gonna say there and this is not about you paul this is about me if i don't know what a person does sometimes you have to then as the listener get up a tiny bit of courage to ask what that is 
or you try to hide that you don't know what it is by like being big. And I'm sure you've seen that a bunch, right? Like people just are like, oh, tell me more about that. And you're all like, you don't know what it is. And I don't think you're trying to be cute. Like I understand, but if you don't have a lot of personal self-confidence or you're not super like, uh, if you don't have a ton of social status either, and this is true for everybody, this isn't so much true. Paul's an artist, people are happy to ask about art usually. But if you have a little bit of an esoteric job title or you are a higher status person than the person you're talking to or they perceive you to be higher status. So like if you are from, if you're rich, I don't know who's rich on this call. Uh, if you used to be rich or came from money, if you have an expensive education or um, secondary degrees, those things can make people who don't have those things feel embarrassed about asking for clarification or follow up. I know I am, as a journalist, when I have my work hat on, I'm totally like, hey, I don't know what that is, please tell me. But if I'm just like totally meeting you out at cocktails or worse, if you're like a friend of a friend and I feel like I should know what you do, I am like, so I'm often like kind of embarrassed because I don't want to seem like an unsophisticated person. And then that's a barrier to us having good follow up because I'm just going to be like, I love your shoes or something, uh, which like might be what you want to talk about, but it's then hard to bring me back into like talking about your job. So that's my thing there is. So Paul, if you would say like, oh, I'm an artist and a teacher. I do a thing called Scratchboard, which is, you know, you can define it or not. But if you say I also have online courses, that like starts to give us more to talk about right off the top where I wouldn't be maybe like embarrassed. But again, I am acknowledging with an artist, I think people are pretty willing to be curious. Um, but like if you were in finance or you had some fancy job title in an office or in marketing or something, not everybody would have the self-confidence to like follow up and just be like, I don't know what that is. So just a tiny thing. We're gonna keep going though, okay guys? We're gonna go into question number two. I'm gonna share my screen again because we're doing great here. You guys are, oh, sorry, I tried to record, but I wasn't trying to record. I just hit the wrong button. Okay, so we're gonna go into question two. Um, why do you care? Now, I assume that people are, like, you know why you care, right? And, and you probably have a lot of reasons for this. So first, I'm going to paste some ideas into our chat real quick, and I want to talk about them. So where we're headed is we want you to start the next sentence with I'm passionate because. And here's why. That is like magic. It's like sprinkling, sprinkling salt all over a conversation and in a cooking way, not in the ruining your fields you can't plant later way. So I want you to know that like when we talk about why we're passionate, we add excitement to the conversation. Literally, I want you to imagine, you and I are at drinks, and I say, yeah, I'm super passionate about this because wouldn't you be like, perk up a little bit? Wouldn't you just be like, oh, that's interesting. She's going to get like a little personal right now, or like, I don't know, maybe she's going to talk about some weird shit. Who knows what I'm going to talk about? But I would definitely like lean in. Um, and here's why. I'm going to put this here, but I think it's really true. Uh, life is really short. <laughs> and I think most people find small talk hard because they're not passionate about small talk. And when we think about how to connect with others, it's rarely going to be us talking about the weather. Now, my big caveat is we are coming into the summer in Phoenix. So I want you to know, I personally allow at least like, I don't know, a full 10 minutes of random chat to be about the weather if you want, because sometimes you can do a lot of bonding over all the places you're sweating from right now. But like, and you know, it's like dangerous and our cars become terrible. And like, there's a lot to talk about here. But like, even after 10 minutes, like you should be like, okay, we can't talk about the weather anymore. Um, and I don't think anybody feels like it's usually a super interesting conversation unless you're a meteorologist. So what we're going to do right now is to say, I am passionate about this because. So now I'm going to tell you my big insight. Most of us are passionate about our work because there is something in us that is affirmed or our work allows us to make something true in the world that we believe should be so. So this opening idea is you are never allowed to say in polite conversation that you're not passionate about your work, like you don't really care, or that you're only doing it for the money. Here's why. It's just rude. Like it's just weird in a small talk. Like it also could be true some days. That's legitimate. But like, ugh, it's a real, it's a real pause button for the conversation. <laughs> no one knows what to say back. But instead, I want you to like really look into your heart and be like, well, what part of me like actually loves the work the most? 
it's probably connected to your personal value system. There's probably something you believe should be true in the world. And so you try to make it so with your physical hands and your mouth. Or there could be something that you believe is like a value, like a core idea that you think everyone should have this thing or have access to this idea. And I want to give them that access. I want to give them that gift or that training or that idea. And so for most of us, when we're having a good day, that is why we show up to work. So I'm going to give you guys a tiny example, and then I'm going to ask you to do your own. But um, it's not a hard stretch. So I'm going to use this really broadly, but a lot of you might have jobs where you are the person that you wish you had as a kid, or you are running a business that would have made a difference for you when you were younger, or you do a thing that would have been the cool thing for your kid self to have known about or done. Uh, that's like why a lot of us do this. And in that story I shared with you guys at the beginning, I mean, I literally was saying like, one of the things I love about doing my, my old job here where I wrote about nightlife events, things to do in Phoenix, um, was that I was from a town that like, I knew what it was like to like be from a place that didn't have a ton of cool stuff. And I valued being able to connect to people who, who did care enough to make, make things cool here in Phoenix. So that's a value of mine, right? Like I value people who try to create sense of place and who have a heart for giving something to their community. I think that's very interesting. And that's who I am as a person, shallow. No, I'm kidding. But like, I really did write about cocktails for years and it was like my favorite part of my life. So I want you to think about like, what like core part of growing up experience what did your family teach you or what did you learn on your own about the world that you think your job now satisfies? The key is here. I'm only going to give you two minutes though. We're not going to overthink this because I know you could be like, oh my God, I could tell a 30 minute story about my grandmother and how she like taught me this thing and I'm living out her dream. That's fair and legitimate. And if you have that story, you should definitely contact me at the Storytellers Project and we'll put you on stage. But for the purposes of small talk, you just want to like barely mention your grandma, but tell me about her key value that she passed on to you. So I do want you to go there. Like, I do want you to think about this core part of yourself. Um, anyway, write it down. I'm going to set my tiny timer. And then we're going to ask you guys to talk about your feelings in just a second. Start. It's going. So I'm going to mute. But I am. All right, we've got the tiny timer. So who wants to tell me, why are you passionate about the work you do? Dr. Beverly, let's do it. Unmute yourself and talk to me about your feelings. Hi, I'm passionate about making a difference and leaving a legacy in the world of nonprofit consulting. Most important to me is to help a nonprofit assess their organization, find out how to fix what's wrong, be the bridge between funding and no funding, and to help build a long-term plan for sustainability and hope in their board members. Ooh, 
Thanks. That was very thorough. This is not Beverly's first. This is not your first rodeo. Um, awesome. Now, when you're just in like casual conversation, how do you, why do you say you're passionate about it though? Because it comes from the inside and it just spills out. And when I talk about it, my eyes start to get misty, like I'm going to cry. So I know that that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, Sue, but tell me, like, what makes you passionate about the work nonprofits are doing? I've been and I have been in a nonprofit, worked in a nonprofit, been on the board of nonprofit organizations over the years. I now have my own nonprofit, private operating foundation. And I know that if you don't have a passion, you can't really do it right. You can't really feel the mission every day and go out and fulfill it. I think I think here's where I'm headed, here's where I'm like trying to go with you though. Like you help other nonprofits get their acts together. Yes. Like I assume you work on purpose, mission statements, fundraising campaigns. Like they've got the passion, but they don't always have the action steps or like the strategic rigor to get, you know, move the ball down the field. So one of the things that makes me curious about you immediately is to say, well, like, was your life changed by a nonprofit? Were you a part of a nonprofit that like failed because it didn't have its feet under it? Did you see something like that happen where like, you know, the difference expert consulting makes in the life of a nonprofit? Yes, I was a board member for a volunteer agency in Flint, Michigan, where I'm originally from. And I found out that we were losing our grant with community mental health for the suicide hotline. And I came to a board meeting and I was the first one there and the youngest board member and the only board member of color way back in the day, a long time ago. So it was important for me to be on the A game. And I asked my executive director, um, how could I help? And she said, find us a grant. And my reply was, what's that? <laughs> and she got mad and she threw down the papers that she was holding. And she said, if you don't know how to connect this organization with funding, what are you doing on my board? Well, that speaks volumes. So, the short way, that is beautiful, first of all, thank you for telling me that. I am also on a board, and I think I am the youngest person on a board, although obviously like a middle-class white lady. Um, so I do think that if you said, I have seen how close incredibly needed nonprofits come to losing their funding or disappearing completely because the board and or members of that organization like don't have the tools they need, and I never want to feel that feeling again. And I don't want you to either. Right. Some, Cause then I, now I like, now I'm curious about you. Like now I want that story and you had it ready. And it like speaks volumes to me about where you've been and who you are. Right. Cause you told me a million things in that story, like pretty casually and very coolly, which I super appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I'm gonna give you my tiny clap, my little internet claps. So it's like rude to do it loudly. Right. But I do want to point out a couple things that she did here really elegantly when she shared that story is um, she acknowledged, right, that she's been civically active since her youth, that she knows what it's like to be the only black person in the room. And so if you are obviously a doctor talking to other people of color, then they're going to like, that's a whole point of conversation. But also for me, as like a white person who is often in a position to like do diversity work as a journalist, I now know this about you. And I might be like, hey, could I like pull you aside to like basically just ask you like three important questions about like inclusivity on a board? And you'd be like, yes, sure. But it'll cost you $150 an hour. No, I'm kidding. She's probably $300 an hour or more. But I would at least know she's a person I should call later to ask about diversity work on a board, right? Um, so I want you to hear in this small moment, if you choose to disclose those things, you are giving your listener a lot to follow up with you about because now I know you have a lot of experience and expertise and stuff that's not necessarily your job title. And we can talk about being from the Midwest or something. Okay, so that was awesome. Um, I see, I, we have a, thank you so much for doing that. Um, I'm gonna now address a couple people in the chat. Um, Gail, thank you for doing that. 
Um, I love this. I totally feel this. Gail's about lacking self-confidence in her life and being fortunate to have mentors and supporters. Gail, I'm going to give you tiny internet snaps. That's perfect. Like, uh, it's vulnerable, but not weird. It's super common for people not to have great self-confidence when meeting strangers. It's relatable, accessible, and it positions you as a person who overcame a problem to become an expert, which is really appealing to meeting people. I actually say that sometimes as I did with you guys, as you heard me say, like sometimes I overshare and that's not always good. Uh, I have also told people like, I, I definitely know that like I missed out on like an important job opportunity once because like I thought I was prepared to bring the right self to that opportunity. Literally, you guys, two years later, this person's friend was like, oh no, he was never going to hire you with that energy. And I was like, well, where were you two years ago? But it's fine. So, you know, now when I do coaching, I'm like, well, I've learned the hard way. So Gail, I think that really matters. Um, Paul, I super appreciate this. I'm passionate about work because technology we're doing the same thousand. Paul, what are you doing? We're uh, developing an artificial intelligence technology for the airline industry uh, to, uh, have you ever heard of the MAX, remember the MAX accident? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, the um, one of the reasons it, it, that that occurred is because pilots were looking for a checklist, a written checklist, and so we're digitizing all that and using artificial intelligence to pull that information up very rapidly for the pilot. Um, in the past, it took minutes to, to page through a book to find out the right checklist to use for a particular emergency. So using AI, we're going to um, shorten that time to a fraction of a second that that information can be brought up for the pilot. Man, Paul, everyone, I just want to point out, if Paul says any of that over cocktails, that's it, the party's over. We're literally just going to give Paul money thank him for his work and ask him 500 questions about airline safety. Um, Paul, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to keep going, but I'm going to like, that's very good. And I, I'm excited for you and I hope that you get money um, personally because I like flying. Um, Marianne, hi, it's nice to see you. Um, this is great. I would want to know why are you passionate again? Cause it's not enough just to say I'm passionate. You have to say I'm passionate because. passionate because I like to help people. I like to improve things and make things better. So that lights me up. Helping someone be better at their job, present better options, making them look good. And that's basically what this role is all about. Awesome. That's great. I mean, it can be as simple as that, you guys. Um, thank you so much, Marion. Good to see you. Allison, good to see you. You guys, Allison helped us. We've done a bunch of storytellers. We used to, we had been doing storytellers nights with Modern Phoenix. So hi, Allison. Thanks for being such a partner to us. Um, you also, by the way, Allison, you should know this. Uh, it resulted in us getting work for the AIA National Conference, like a women's leadership conference, because I was able to say we'd coach so many architects over the years because of our um, shows with you guys. So this is really cool. Allison obviously is saying by day I'm a professor, by night I do this. Um, this is really good. She's connecting a lot here. This is, as you can see, very conversational about the progress Phoenix has made, mid-century design heritage. Bettina, I love this. This is, so I want to point out, Bettina's super straightforward. She's packing a lot of information into here. I am grateful to use my language skills and bicultural awareness. Yes, this is super helpful because now if I know Bettina and I can be like, hey, here's, the, I, I have a sense of what I'd call to ask her about now. And as you guys can hear, that's what we're like driving to accomplish right now is being as specific as possible. Um, I understand what she does, but like, but Tina, I am going to ask you real quick here, though, like, again, you, you hint at it. I'm going to point out here, uh, enable communication between organizations and constituencies who would otherwise be unavailable to them. But Tina, if you would make it like a tiny bit, you know, like that's an opening sentence, but the unpassionate part is like, again, a little bit more related to like, have you seen, did you see areas, right, where like, if you had had that job, you would have solved that problem for someone? Um, or you, or you were shown the importance and relevancy of your work by someone else, and now you want to carry on that work. Um, you don't have to like answer right now, but that that sense of like passion for it, I feel like matters. Um, but listen, you're getting it done. People are contacting you in the chat, so keep going. Um, 
like God bless, right? Nicole, oh boom, <laughs> that's a good answer. Um, this is also good, guys. Like giving your answer why you're passionate can be because she's not being negative here, but she is saying like I've seen what happens when it doesn't work out. So that is like that is legitimate, you know, and reasonable um, to to kind of come in that way. Um, hi, Kelsey, happy to see you. Um, I love this. She's like, preserve the garden, foster and nourish a love of nature. And says, oh, see, she makes it personal. You can totally follow up with her about being a mom right now. Um, this is great. Like she's making it personal. She's connecting it to the future. Um, I'm a supporter. I'm a huge supporter of the DDG. And this is something Kelsey and I talk about all the time, especially around, I'm giving this to you for free because Kelsey already has benefited from it. But we talk about um, when she fundraises for the garden or she tries to get people excited about the garden, one of the things we talk about is that for people kind of like under, I would say like under 50 are rarely on boards. They're not usually big donors for reasons having to do with the economy a lot of times, but also because they weren't cultivated. So if any of you run a large nonprofit, I'm just like, this is a side thing, but I do think it's important you hear it. If any of you are part of a nonprofit in the Valley, um, one of the things that we talk about um, is that, you want to invite people to be the part part of the future of Phoenix, because if they don't show up today to help design what that institution looks like in the future, it won't be relevant to people like them in the future. So as you're like trying to talk to people of color or people who are of non-traditional donation background, so like people who grew up poor, people who might only be making say $60,000 a year, but you're cultivating them at the like lower dollar level, like I do want you to hear, like you should talk to those people about how to get involved at the poor level or the or the donation or the um, volunteer level, because uh, that really means a lot to me. Like I know if I don't show up for Phoenix today, like it's not going to be better tomorrow magically. Like it won't be like more accessible or inclusive if I don't like roll up my sleeves today. So that's like my two cents that Kelsey and I talk about a lot about the garden, because I do think the garden like works hard to try to like appeal to a broad diversity of people so that the garden can meet their social and emotional needs in the future as Phoenix becomes more diverse. Um, we're going to go to our last segment in just a second, but you guys are totally on a roll. Um, Alex, thank you. A space representative of the global woman. Um, again, but why are you passionate, Alex? That's what you want to do, but it isn't telling me about yourself, like what motivates you to do that. So like, if you're like, I don't feel represented in places and I want to create that representation for others, that gives me the insight into you as a person. But I do love the sparkle bar and God bless you. Like I understand particularly um, certain skin tones not being represented in the beauty, in our beauty culture. Uh, and certainly as like a professional makeup artist, like you're doing the Lord's work. So if you guys don't know about like underrepresentation in fashion and beauty, corner Alex and ask her to talk to you about it because sure she could write a paper. Uh, sorry, I'm going to try to go a little faster. Anyway, guys, um, Melody, workforce and education consultant. Oh my God, you are also doing the Lord's work. So I want to point out, Melody has moved in a, in a like uh, proactively, like she's passionate because she's ch seen change. So she's saying I'm passionate because her programs can revitalize. Yada, yada, yada. So, you know, Melody, to make it a tiny bit more specific, if I could gently invite you to just say like, I have seen I am passionate because I have seen firsthand how these programs do X and Y and Z. That is easier for me to understand because again, you work in like sort of, um, I assume like on policy and probably intergovernmental, like kind of big ideas and big stuff. So if you can make it personal and practical, again, that helps me like see it in my baby brain because like I might not have any idea of, like I might not have a ton of context about what you do. Um, so anyway, guys, I am going to try to wrap this up, but you guys are hearing what I'm saying each time, right? Like I'm saying the why about you, not the why about the what, because I want you to hear, I want to hear why you doing this thing, because it has something to do with yourself. And it's not narcissism, right? It's just like giving me insight into who you are as a person. Okay, guys, we're going to bring this train into the station we've spent a long time but you guys are like doing a great job so we're gonna like letting this do what it is here's my last question how do you make a difference for the person oh thanks Shelly but it is like I do want to know about this is where we're getting into the what so the last thing you say how do you make a difference for the end user client blah 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 
So I'm going to give you an actual example that I've used because I'm on the board of the Phoenix Theater. And so when I talk about being on the board, and by the way, if you want to steal this, like if you manage boards, um, I guess I will also want to know um, what Dr. Beverly has to say about this idea since she knows. Um, but when I worked with the board of the Phoenix Theater, of which I am a member, um, I wanted, I assumed that most people we'd be interacting with were like just people who live in Phoenix. And I want you to know, they don't care why I'm on the board. This is really important that you guys know this. No one cares really like what you are on a board or like per se, because people actually think that boards are for like rich white people who don't have anything to do with their time. And they don't always realize that there's like a pretty big dollar donation or there's a pretty big time donation. Truly, like regular humans just think that like boards are things magical, rich white people, particularly old people, like just end up doing. So when you want to help your board or you want to talk about being a member of a board, you always want to say, I volunteer and I give because, right? Because literally people don't know that like those are the first two asks. Give me a time. Give me a money. Give me a friend's email addresses, right? So like people don't know that. But here's what I say. I always say that because of my volunteerism, um, I help to connect, I help to make sure that Phoenix has world-class theatrical talent at like an affordable price point year round. And that there are camps and there are cheap tickets and there are great productions that are like super family friendly and accessible and they are available to you in Phoenix, Arizona because of the work these people do. It's not fancy and I'm not like defending it as opposed to like Arizona theater or um, you know, Arizona Theater Company. Like I'm not, I'm not saying anything about anybody's work one way or the other. I'm just saying, if these people didn't show up to volunteer, this place wouldn't exist and you'd have one fewer place to go see theater. And people totally take for granted, right? Like if you work in an arts institution, you know everyone just expects you to exist. Like they're like, yeah, of course we have a symphony. Of course we have the theater. Of course we have the ballet. Of course we have a big art museum. Like all, and then you're like, uh, no, not of course. Like they literally don't exist if you don't show up and volunteer or donate or something like that. So while you, some of you make a difference for a very specific constituency, I'm actually going to call on Kelly. Um, hang on, I'm double checking. No, Melody, I'm going to call on you if you will talk with me. Will you unmute and chat with me for a second? Hi. Yes. Hi, Melody. So here, you have a really interesting job that I think can stand in for a lot of people. You help a really specific group of people who are not me. Mm -hmm. And what I want to hear is I want you to tell me, I understand what you do for them. Can you explain why I should care what you do for them? Ooh. Okay. It's okay if you can't, because I'll just tell you what you should say. But I want to hear, like, if you've ever tried to make a random white person give a shit about Native American people and their resiliency. No, I can't. Okay, so that's a really good question. I think for for me, when I'm going to answer that, it's very um, like a personal thing, right? Like it's like I'm I'm coming from a different perspective. So to put myself in your shoes to answer that, <laughs> I'm trying to no. think like, how can I put this in terms. No, and I do, and I don't want to put you on the spot. So I was generally asking. So Melody, you're standing in for a lot of people. So first, I want to thank you for like letting me call on you. And I want yeah. everyone who feels like they're in Melody's shoes where they're like, maybe you raise money or maybe your your job is like for a specific group of people or you work at a nonprofit that's like for a group of people that I'm not a part of. So Melody, here's what I want to offer you and for anybody else who's in Melody's shoes where the audience they're meeting with or they're interacting with might actually not personally benefit from their work. Maybe they're never going to shop in your store. Maybe they're never going to take a class from you. Like maybe they don't live in your community so they can't access your resources or your work. It doesn't mean we don't have something to talk about, and it doesn't mean you don't actually help me in the long run. So, Melody, what I think you can do, now granted this is some like heavy lifting for like social justice work, but you seem like you have strong shoulders and that you're willing to do it. So here's what I'm going to offer you. For any of you who have to talk to people who can't figure out why what you do matters to them, you can always say, well, when I help these people, in whichever category you're working, whether it's like with like sick kids or obviously native communities, you can say like, when these people get the help they need, like they can more fully participate in our society, which you are a part of. Yeah. And then you benefit from all the beautiful good things that they bring into the world because they're fully enfranchised. 
or because then they're not sick anymore or because they, you know, like whoever the people are and what the problem is. So I want to point out to you, Melody, like I personally super care because like in my work at the Arizona Republic, like I've um, interacted with native communities and like had, you know, like when I moved to Arizona though, like I didn't know these, I didn't know native people and like I've learned all these things. Um, but most people don't, it's not always easy, especially in times right now where people are living in a moment of scarcity to understand how other people thriving is connected to their own humanity and empathy and like participation in the world. So for all of you on this call, you're really lucky if you have a business or nonprofit or an organization that is like generally open to the people of the state, mm -hmm. because then you can totally be like, uh, yeah, you can take a class from me. You can shop in my shop. You can come to my, you know, Kelsey with the DBG, like just it's open almost every day of the year, I think, or all the days of the year, like just walk in, right? But if uh, you are like Melody and you have a responsibility to a specific group of people, there is that extra layer of asking yourself, but why would somebody who's never going to benefit from my work want me to be good at my job? And, and I think you answer that by giving them the benefit of that, by like thinking about like empathy, society, all of us participating in like living in Arizona together as a big community, you know, that kind of thing. But it is a real barrier. Like, I think it's a barrier, right? Yeah. I was thinking like too specific and not globally. So thank you. Yeah. No, totally. Well, it's also like you're solving for like, um, people don't have good imaginations, right? Like they don't. Um, I'm going to give you guys one more example. I was once teaching this to, um, I was teaching this to a group of um, Hispanic City of Phoenix employees. And um, this guy was like, basically he worked as a CPA. He worked as an accountant for fire and police to like make sure money goes where it goes. And that seems like an incredibly unsexy job just for me, like as a casual listener, I was like, okay, why should I care about this guy having this job? And I live in Phoenix, so I genuinely was like, why should I care? And you know what he said? Well, I'm from, a, he was from a country in South America that deals with a lot of corruption and like bribery. And he was saying that like, he knew that as a poor family, he was like, how will we ever get what we need if we don't have the money to grease the wheels? And he was able to get an education in America and stay here. And he looked at me and said, now my job is to make sure that all of your tax dollars go where you think they'll go, that they don't go to line a policeman's pockets, they go to build a police station. And you guys, I was like, thank God for doing your job. You're like Batman. Like, you're like saving my, I don't know. I was so impressed with him. But I didn't have the imagination to like connect the dots of like, why do I care if like Phoenix police and fire have a good accountant? And he was like, because you pay taxes and you need them to like show up. So you do care. And I was like, oh my God, you're like blowing my mind. So I am asking all of you, when you think about small talk, it is important to talk about the specific constituents you serve. But if you can spend a little bit of time going that one extra step to be like, yeah, and here's why it makes a difference to you. Now, I'm not saying everyone you talk to is like that self-involved, that they like need a personal connection to everyone's good work. But it is like, it is a nice thing because it can only like serve you in the long run. So you guys, these are the three steps to really great small talk. I know we've gone a tiny bit over, but if you're willing to stay with me, I would like one volunteer who we haven't heard from yet. Also, thank you. I'm giving you a tiny clap. Um, Melody, I appreciate you like letting me have your work as an example. You're a good sport. Um, would anybody who has not talked yet be willing to do um, a like mock back and forth with me where we model this behavior and see how smooth and easy small talk conversation can be? I can call on someone who's already gone. I was just trying to like open it up. All right, Marsha, you will. Okay, you wanna unmute yourself? No? Hi, Marsha. Hello. Okay, so I don't know Marsha, and we haven't done this, so she's like legit, this is not a plant. Okay, Marsha, so nice to meet you. So you're a member of Local First? Yes, nice to meet you too. Now go into number one, like just- Oh, go, just go right into take it. Take it away, okay. take it away. Um, I work for the Herberger Theater, and I create free public arts experiences uh, while raising money to support the Herberger Theater and the extraordinary work it does in our community. That's so interesting. All right, guys, spoiler alert. People are just going to say whatever they're going to say. Marsha keeps going with, why are you passionate? 
Okay. I'm passionate about the arts because I've seen the impact they have on myself and my children. And arts in our community are what, what, what makes uh, life exciting, fun, and worthwhile. And um, I feel that without the arts, it's like eating a chip without salsa. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, that's great. Okay. You're good. Sorry, Bring my husband's talking in the background. No, you're fine. You're right. Bring it home and say to me, um, <laughs> when I'm good at my job, um, like, so make it relevant to me. I live downtown. I've been to the Herb Burger, so I'm a warm audience. How do you make my life better? Um, I make your life better because I provide all these free experiences. Oh. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. I provide all these free experiences to people and um, allow uh, people who maybe never touch the arts to have the opportunity to do so and not feel intimidated by the arts. Um, and that makes all of our lives better. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Okay, that was it. That was really, really good. I'm gonna give you a tiny clap. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna affirm you here so everyone can hear. Here's what you did well, you were specific. You were personal um, and it, like you told me that it, you, it's made a difference in your life and your kids. Totally like not stressful like at all. You know, like we can follow up about that and ask more questions if we want. Um, and you didn't have to be super personal because like probably organically in conversation, I'd follow up to be like, oh, tell me about like your family's connection to the arts or something. You'd be like, oh yeah, my kids go to camp or whatever. I used to be an actress or you are an actress now. I have no idea. So, okay. Um, you had a good, you had like a good energy and at the end, you guys, what I want you to hear again is like, she did make it and Bettina says you were natural and Nicole says great job. Um, you do, if you can, you do want to make it relevant to the listener, right? So, um, when you said like, because I do this, you know, I'm, you can come to free stuff at the Herberger because I'm good at my job. Very relevant to me, right? Like very helpful. I live nearby and I like free things. I love the arts. Um, so you did a great job. Tiny clap. Okay. Um, everybody, you have stayed on for seven minutes longer than I promised you. Um, I am going to send to local first a copy of the column, which has all the written chatter. If you want to like reread like a narrative version of this session, I'm also going to send them the worksheet so that you can do this later. If any of you are the leaders of a team, I would like to gently invite you to like use this worksheet with your people. It is scalable and replicable, like, and it is free for you to use because I want you to keep making yours on awesome. Also, now in exchange for this, my ask of you is say nice things about the paper. Please subscribe to the Arizona Republic if you don't already. And if you have not been to an Arizona Storyteller show, um, you should watch us online. Our next show is going to be the 14th, and we will be hearing from chefs from across the country to raise money for Feeding America. You guys want to donate to Feeding America. Um, so that's my hard pitch. If you want to get in touch with us, um, I yes, we do have a link. Um, and I will like put all this in an email and local first. Hopefully we'll share it with you guys directly so that I don't spam you. I'm kidding, I wouldn't spam you, but they've got your emails. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate your time today. God bless. <laughs>